We've been saying for years now that, despite the Liberals' claims, the handgun freeze will have no impact on public safety. What if I told you that the Supreme Court of Canada actually agrees? With us. Would this mean that the freeze is unconstitutional? Let's have a look. Before we get started, fair warning, this video is mostly going to be a talking head video with not much visual information. So if you want to listen to this, you know, in the background or while you're on the go or while you're driving or something like that, that might be a better way to experience this content. However, I am going to be citing all of my sources on screen and citing precedent as we go. So if you decide you want to watch this and follow along, you might actually learn a thing or two about how the charter works in Canada, or at the very least, you'll be able to check my homework. Welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be discussing a bit of legal precedent. Now, this might get a little wordy for a lot of people, and this video is going to be a bit longer than usual, but please stick with me until the end, because you're going to want to hear this. Today I'll be making the case that Canada's handgun freeze is actually a violation of the Canadian Charter and Rights of Freedoms, but it's a pretty nuanced argument, and there's no way to shrink this down into like an easy, like, bite-sized video. Now, that being said, I will still be making a good attempt to walk you through it so that most people watching this video, even those with no prior legal knowledge or background, should still have a pretty good chance of understanding this argument fully. I'm also going to try to explain this well enough so that even if you aren't knowledgeable about Canadian laws, or even if you're not a Canadian at all, you should still be able to follow along. This argument may start off a little bit weak initially, but every point in this video is critical to the punchline and the arguments will get better and more compelling as we go, so please have a little patience. But lots to go through, so let's get started. So, over the last year or so, I've been reading a ton of constitution and firearm related court cases in order to help with my planned series regarding the CCFR's court case from last year. And while doing that, I came across this little gem. This is a case from back in the year 2000, and it was a ruling which was handed down by the Supreme Court of Canada itself. This case was regarding the enactment of the Firearms Act. In this case, the provinces, as well as a couple of other parties of interest, more or less banded together to take on the federal government over the issue of firearms regulation. The provinces essentially claimed that the measures in the Firearms Act were about property rights and regulatory law, and therefore outside the jurisdiction of the federal government, whereas the federal government said that this was about public safety and reducing the misuse of firearms, therefore it's criminal law. In the end, the Supreme Court ruled that, quote, the Firearms Act constitutes a valid exercise of Parliament's jurisdiction over criminal law, end quote, and therefore the appeal was dismissed. Now, along the way, the Supreme Court actually said a number of very interesting and relevant things about the relationship between legal firearm ownership and public safety in Canada. Now, in legal terms, the nature of the law is determined by its pith and substance. Or in other words, how can we know for sure that the Firearms Act actually was a public safety measure and therefore within the federal government's jurisdiction of criminal law? The Supreme Court clearly answers this question in paragraph 4, and the way they answer this question is what makes this case so interesting. It says, quote, the effects of the scheme, how it impacts on the legal rights of Canadians, also support the conclusion that the 1995 gun control law is, in pith and substance, a public safety measure. The criteria for acquiring a license are concerned with safety rather than the regulation of property. Criminal record checks and background investigations are designed to keep guns out of the hands of those incapable of using them safely. Safety courses ensure that gun owners are qualified. End quote. This tells us that the purpose of the Firearms Act, at least according to the Supreme Court of Canada, is to ensure firearms are kept out of the hands of those incapable of using them safely. This view is also shared by the Alberta Court of Appeal. What this means is that according to both the Alberta Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court of Canada, the core fundamental purpose of firearms licensing and registration is to ensure that only qualified individuals can acquire and use firearms. So that's one of the two things that we're going to use from this case. Let's keep reading paragraph 24 to see the other half of this argument. Quote, what the law does not require also shows that the operation of the scheme is limited to ensuring safety. For instance, the act does not regulate the legitimate commercial market for guns. It then goes on to say, the effects of the law suggest that its essence is the promotion of public safety through the reduction and misuse of firearms. And this negates the proposition that Parliament was in fact attempting to achieve a different goal, such as the total regulation of firearms, production, trade, and ownership. We therefore conclude, viewed from its purpose and its effects, that the Firearms Act is, in pith and substance, directed to public safety. Some of you may have caught on by now, but how does this all relate to the handgun freeze? Well, by using the same criteria, we can actually evaluate the freeze itself to determine if it is in fact a public safety measure, as the Liberals claim, by analyzing these same metrics which were established by the Supreme Court. 
So first off, the Firearms Act was identified as a public safety measure because it was aimed at identifying qualified individuals through a licensing scheme and then ensuring that only those qualified individuals could have firearms through their registration scheme. This scheme was enacted explicitly with the intent of reducing firearm misuse, according to the Supreme Court. The handgun freeze violates this basic rationale of public safety, as its primary purpose is to deny even those who are qualified with the appropriate licenses from acquiring handguns. People can still take the restricted firearm safety course and apply for an RPAL and still get it. And on top of that, the RPAL course still involves safety training with handguns. Therefore, it's still possible to become qualified to own and operate handguns, but the new registration limitation in C21 prevents them from acquiring handguns anyway. This new limitation goes far beyond just reducing misuse and the intended safety nature of licensing and registration, according even to the Supreme Court. However, one could try to counter this argument by saying ownership of any kind is vulnerable to misuse, and therefore it is still a public safety measure. And for what it's worth, that could even be true to some degree, since that's often the rationale used to support firearm bans here in Canada. But let's take a look at exactly how the freeze proposes to solve that problem. The most important thing to note here is that, as the government has repeatedly said, the freeze is not technically a ban. If you remember, that was actually their primary talking point all throughout the C21 process. On uh, banning, uh, sorry, on freezing uh, the market for firearms. If those are the objectives where handguns are concerned, again, why not introduce a ban? Why just a freeze? Because we listened very carefully. In nearly every press conference and debate, they made an absolute point of ensuring that everyone in the country knew, absolutely for sure, that from their point of view, this was in fact not a ban, it was just a freeze. Now precedent tells us that firearm bans, like the automatic firearms ban in 1978, are entirely permissible as public safety measures. And while I think there are some legitimate arguments to be made against that, the courts have settled it. This also means that what I'm discussing today will have no effect on the assault style bans back in 2020. But, according to the Liberals themselves, the handgun freeze isn't a ban. This is because, unlike a ban, the freeze does not prohibit the possession or use of handguns. What it actually outlaws is the trading of handguns. People can no longer buy, sell, transfer, or bequeath their handguns. So in the legal pith and substance analysis, its only effect is that it heavily restricts the commercial market on handguns. And according to our court case, the Supreme Court of Canada explicitly states that this is not a public safety measure. The Supreme Court says, quote, what the law does not require also shows that the operation of the scheme is limited to ensuring safety. For instance, the act does not regulate the commercial market for guns, end quote. And it even goes so far as to specifically say that measures which would regulate the production, trade, or ownership are not public safety measures. But the handgun freeze exclusively interferes with only the lawful trading of firearms. That's what it's designed to do, and that's all it's designed to do, according to the government. And therefore, the handgun freeze is expressly not a public safety measure, according to the Supreme Court. And if you think that's a bit of a stretch, look at exactly how the government refers to their freeze. The federal government is moving to cap the number of handguns in Canada. We have frozen the market for handguns in this country. In other words, we're capping the market for handguns. They always describe it as closing the market or as freezing the market. As such, there can be no doubt that the freeze is explicitly a market regulation, and this means it is not a safety regulation, according to the Supreme Court. It exclusively bans handgun commerce and not handgun licensing, ownership, or use. Now, on its own, this really doesn't tell us much other than the fact that we can now prove the government is lying about the fact that this is a public safety measure. Which, <laughs> I mean, you know, go figure. This could be useful for discussing some legal avenues such as a colorable motive, but those are actually quite difficult to prove. For our video today, we're going to take this in a different direction and use it to directly challenge the Charter. To do this, we're going to start by showing how the handgun freeze actually violates the Liberty Clause in Section 7 of the Charter. Now, a lot of you would probably say that all gun control is a violation of your liberty and of your freedom, but liberty, at least in the legal sense, has a somewhat different and much more narrow meaning than you think it does, so such an argument doesn't really work in Canadian law. Section 7 of the Charter ensures your liberty, provided it's in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. Anytime there is a criminal law enacted, and that law is backed up by prison time, it engages the Liberty Clause of Section 7, since being put in prison is 
obviously a violation of your liberty. However, such laws are still entirely permissible, provided they are written and enacted in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. This exception is how we're legally able to even have prisons in our society in the first place. The handgun freeze regulates registration, and registration directly governs Section 91 of the Criminal Code, which does include prison time as a punishment. So Section 7 is engaged, and now we just need to prove that the freeze is fundamentally unjust. And that's actually a little bit more difficult than you think it would be. In order to prove that a law is fundamentally unjust, that would typically require you to prove that the law is somehow arbitrary, overbroad, or grossly disproportionate. Now, while I don't think that that's entirely impossible in this instance, it is a rather difficult task, as those words also don't mean what you think they mean when they're used in the law. However, it's worth noting that these are not the only three principles of fundamental justice in Canadian law. And here's where things start to get fun. Special thanks to John Olson7079 for pointing this out to me in the comment sections from a previous video. So first off, I'm going to cite the ruling, and then I'm going to explain to you what it means. So check this out. In the case of The Crown versus Morgenthaler from 1988 on page 70, they have this to say. Quote, The principles of fundamental justice are to be found in the basic tenets of our legal system. One of these basic tenets of our system of criminal justice is that when Parliament creates a defense to a criminal charge, the defense should not be illusory or so difficult to attain as to be practically illusory. The criminal law is a very special form of governmental regulation, for it seeks to express our society's collective disapprobation of certain acts and omissions. When a defense is provided, especially a specifically tailored defense to a particular charge, it is because the legislator has determined that the disapprobation of society is not warranted when the conditions of that defense are met. So what exactly were they talking about in this case specifically? Well, this was the case that actually made abortion laws unconstitutional in Canada. So, you know, kind of a pretty big deal. Prior to this decision, Section 251 of the Criminal Code said you could go to jail if you have an abortion. However, it said you would not go to jail if you met the appropriate criteria. And this criteria was centered around what was essentially an abortion certificate. Now, the Supreme Court struck down anti-abortion laws for far more reasons than just this. But one of the things they said along the way was that these abortion certificates are fundamentally unjust under Section 7 because they were far too difficult for most women to reasonably acquire. The government essentially said, you know, if you want to have an abortion, just get a certificate. Oh, and by the way, we've made these certificates borderline impossible to get. The Supreme Court ruled outright that this behavior from the government is fundamentally unjust under Section 7. Do you see where this is headed yet? Section 91 of the Criminal Code is set up nearly identically to that old abortion law. It says you go to jail if you have a firearm, but it also says you will not go to jail if you have the appropriate license and in the case of a restricted firearm, if you also have a registration certificate for that firearm. A firearms license in Canada, as most of you probably know, is called a PAL or a PAL, which is a Possession and Acquisition License. This license, as the name indicates, gives you the express authorization to possess and acquire firearms. And an RPAL, which I have, extends that authorization to restricted firearms. And handguns are classified as restricted firearms in Canada. So just like the old abortion law, if somebody attempts to acquire a handgun in Canada, they will violate Section 91 of the Criminal Code unless they comply with both of the specifically tailored defenses laid out in it. Now, I have an RPAL, and therefore I am legally authorized to acquire handguns. However, if I use that license for its intended purpose in order to actually acquire a handgun, I will go directly to jail as there's no way for me to meet the other requirement to get a registration certificate since the government now simply refuses to issue them. And, according to the Supreme Court Morgenthaler, quote, when Parliament creates a defense to a criminal charge, the defense should not be illusory or so difficult to obtain as to be practically illusory. This means, as a direct result of the handgun freeze, Section 91B of the Criminal Code has become illusory in the law. According to the Supreme Court precedent laid out in Morgenthaler, there must be some reasonable way for a properly licensed individual to acquire a registration certificate, otherwise Section 91B of the Criminal Code is invalid. Registration certificates for handguns must not be so difficult to obtain as to be practically illusory. This precedent by the Supreme Court would mean that Section 91 explicitly states that it's okay for you to acquire a handgun, provided you just get licensed and it's registered. And therefore, the purpose of Section 91 isn't to prohibit handguns. The purpose is to ensure a reasonable path towards ownership and use of handguns. And the exceptions to the freeze, namely the requirements for ATCs or Olympic sport shooting, 
they're simply too difficult to qualify for. Nearly everyone in Canada who holds an RPAL will not be able to qualify for these exceptions. For reference, according to the RCMP, there were over 700,000 active RPAL holders in 2022. And according to the handgun freeze OIC, there are only about 14,000 individuals exempted from that freeze. This represents just under 2% exemption rate, or about one in every 50 RPAL holders. Compare this with the Morgenthaler abortion case, and the court was concerned that even only 20% of hospitals meeting this requirement was simply not enough. And therefore, the specifically tailored defense in section 91B of the criminal code to require a registration certificate for a handgun is so difficult to obtain as to be practically illusory as a direct result of the freeze, and this makes it unjust. All of this is to say that the handgun freeze violates the liberty clause in section seven of the charter, and it violates that liberty in a fundamentally unjust way. This proves that the handgun freeze is a Section 7 charter violation based on Supreme Court precedent. And even if I am somehow wrong about this interpretation of Section 7, there are many other ways to make this argument under Section 7, and we could also be very easily arguing violations under Section 15 for discrimination, or Section 8 for unreasonable seizure, or any number of other possibilities. Although each of those sections comes with their own caveats as well. Now, unfortunately, in Canada, just because the government is violating your charter rights, that isn't enough in and of itself to strike down a faulty law like a handgun freeze. The government may try to fall back on their trump card and say that firearms are not a right in Canada and that they are merely just a privilege, but I made a video recently explaining why that is wrong as well, so be sure to check it out if you haven't already. However, even if they are just a privilege, that claim wouldn't really be relevant here. And that's because this argument is based on a principle of fundamental justice, meaning that the violation isn't actually firearm related, but justice related. So realistically, they can't use that lame argument here. Now what they can say, however, and what the charter allows them to do, is claim protection under section one of the charter. Section one allows them to violate your section seven rights and most of your other rights and freedoms, in fact, provided that they're doing it in the name of a greater societal good. Now I take great issue with that threshold for many reasons, not the least of which is because that perverted interpretation is not actually at all what section one of the charter says, but that is the well-established standard in Canadian law, so that's what we're going to be using today. If we take a look at the Chartopedia, it says that the rights protected by section seven are basic to our concept of a free and democratic society, and violations of the principles of fundamental justice are therefore difficult to justify. However, the Supreme Court has indicated that there may be room to justify an infringement of section seven under section one, where the government can point to an important public good or competing social interest that are themselves protected by the charter as justification for the infringement. One of these well-established important public goods, legally referred to as a pressing and substantial objective, is public safety. Public safety is regularly cited and used, especially by current liberal government, to violate your rights. It's the phrase they've been using for years now to pass nearly every controversial law thus far and it's the shield for many of their upcoming ones like Bill C-63. It has essentially become their own little notwithstanding clause used to enact basically any tyrannical law that they want. However, if you remember how this video started, we already established that the freeze doesn't qualify as a public safety measure, but rather as a market measure. And that's based on Supreme Court precedent. So that claim is no longer valid. But even if it were, that claim would have to pass the test laid out in section one, which I will explain in a moment. However, there are other defenses available to them under Section 1. For example, where the limit arises from complex policy decisions involving the assessment of conflicting social science evidence, compelling interests, demand on resources, and the protection of vulnerable groups, where there is room to debate what will work and what will not, or where the limit is a complex regulatory response to a difficult social problem. And when such limits arise, there is a standardized test used by the Supreme Court to interpret whether or not it's appropriate to use Section 1 of the Charter to limit people's rights. This is known as the Oaks Test. And the Oaks Test is actually rather basic on its surface and only has two requirements. So step one is to determine if the legislative goal is pressing and substantial. Like for example, is the objective sufficiently important to justify limiting a charter right? And then step two is actually kind of the, the test portion of the test. And it asks, is there proportionality between the objective and the means used to achieve it? So essentially part one is the reason why they feel they have the ability to violate your rights, and then part two just requires them to justify it. Their justification is analyzed in three different ways, but it's important to note that if it fails any one of these three parts, then the entire test fails, and it cannot be demonstrably justified under section one. 
And this video is already getting rather long, so I'm not going to address minimal impairment or final balancing today, but I am going to embarrass them on the rational connection portion of this test. The first thing to note here is that the burden of proof lies with the party seeking to uphold the limit. In this case, the government. So in a sense, the Oak test puts our rights and freedoms on trial, and those rights and freedoms are sort of innocent until proven guilty. Although in practice, the actual standard is, it's a fair bit lower than that. The standard of proof is the civil standard, which is essentially just a balance of probabilities. Or in other words, is it likely that the government's chosen methods will assist in their stated objective? However, it's not quite as simple as that. The Oaks test was introduced in 1986, and its understanding has evolved slightly over the years. In the Emergencies Act ruling from the Honorable Justice Mosley earlier this year, which I also did a video on, he had this to say about the Oaks test. In paragraph 342, he said, quote, the infringing measures must be based on a rational inference from evidence or established truths. Bare assertions will not suffice. Evidence supplemented by common sense and inference is needed. And in 2019, in the case of Frank versus Canada, paragraph 59, quote, the rational connection step requires that the measure must not be arbitrary, unfair, or based on irrational considerations. Essentially, the government must show that there is a causal connection between the limit and the intended purpose. In cases where a causal connection is not scientifically measurable, one can be made out of the basis of reason or logic as opposed to concrete proof." End quote. So in attempting to establish a rational connection, we can simplify this into four easy rules based on these two precedents. So first off, bare assertions are insufficient. Evidence is needed. Secondly, this evidence must show causality. Third, the measure must not be based on irrational considerations. And fourth, only where a causal link is not possible can we defer to reason or logic alone. So, let's put the freeze through the Oaks test. The measure is obvious. I mean, it's their claim that more guns means more harm. So they are freezing the market on handguns so that there won't be more handguns to cause more harm. The handgun OIC from October 21st, 2022 is really clear about this. So what is their pressing and substantial objective? Well, actually they have several ideas in mind. And these ideas are all spelled out rather clearly in the benefit section of the handgun freeze OIC. So they are after crime prevention, harm prevention, gender-based or intimate partner violence, mental health issues, and MCIs. I'm going to save the breakdown of the stats for each of these topics for another video, but these objectives are all essentially under the umbrella of public safety. However, as we already discussed, based on legal precedent, the freeze isn't a public safety measure. But precedent aside, it also isn't a safety measure in a practical sense either. Failing to ban or confiscate these firearms mean that these handguns are still in the hands of everyday folk. So if the claim is that they are causing harm, then they can still cause harm as they are still in the hands of Canadians, and therefore the freeze doesn't actually address this issue in any meaningful way. That being said, I'm still going to put the claim of public safety through the test anyway. So where do they get the evidence that says that more handguns equals more harm? Well, they only actually cite one source of information in the entirety of the handgun OIC. One source may not sound like much, but in fairness to the government here, once we're at the point of legislation or order and councils being enacted, the time for debate and talk really is over. And this particular source is actually an agglomeration of a significant number of different studies kind of all wrapped up into one. However, being that this is their only source, one should also assume that it is their best source. There'd be no legitimate reason for them to be downplaying their evidence or pulling their punches that their order is based on. So this source is titled Firearm Availability and Homicide, a review of the literature. And this is from the journal Aggression and Violent Behavior. The information we're going to discuss here is just a part of the summary, but that's, that's more than enough to debunk their evidence here. The link to this and everything else I'll show in this video is in the description below if you want to check that out for yourself. So here we go. We're going to start at the end. In the conclusion, they actually say some pretty damning things here but also one very curious thing. So it starts by saying that the available evidence is quite consistent. The few case control studies suggest that households with firearms are at higher risk for homicide, particularly firearm homicide. International cross-sectional studies of high-income countries find that in countries with more firearms, both men and women are at a higher risk for homicide, particularly firearm homicide. And <laughs> that sounds pretty bad, right? But then it finishes with this. This result is primarily due to the United States, which had the highest levels of household ownership of private firearms. And if you go back to read the summary from the top, it is very clearly not talking about Canada or even most countries in general. 
I mean, you just take a look at the first sentence here. It says, quote, in the past 35 years, homicide rates in the United States have moved in cycles, end quote. And in the next 22 paragraphs on this page, they repeatedly talk about America and U.S. cities and the ATF and the FBI and so on. Know what never, ever shows up on this page? Canada. Or any other country for that matter. So once again, we see Trudeau putting Canadians on the hook for America's gun issues. Now, in the abstract at the very top, they say that based on their international studies, of which there were only seven, they typically showed an increased risk of homicide in relation to more firearms ownership. Now, typically, meaning that more often than not, more guns does mean more homicide. Now, again, I know that sounds pretty bad, but this wording also means that sometimes more guns does not mean more homicide. And being that the sample size is only seven articles, what is that? Is that like four to three, five to two? Like, what are we talking about here? That, that's hardly conclusive evidence. And that's certainly not anything even in the ballpark of causality as the Oak Test requires. Know how I know that's not causality? Because the damn article itself explicitly says it doesn't prove causality. What? Okay, fine, fine, I'm cool, I'm fine. The article used as the chief source of information by the liberals, arguably their best source for why they had to implement the handgun freeze, admits on its own, and very overtly, that it is not evidence. All they examined was the statistical association between gun availability and homicide. That's it. And not only that, but there are significant gaps in their analysis as well. Quote, the article does not address research that has investigated the relationship between firearm regulations and homicide, nor do we claim to review every study examining the association of firearm availability and homicide. And in addition, we do not discuss related studies that provide indirect evidence on the relationship between firearm availability and homicide, end quote. They also stipulate a great many other possible reasons for other associations for the increased observations other than gun ownership itself. And many of these things are entirely valid considerations that the article just opts to not address. They looked at the problem purely one-dimensionally and intentionally avoided analyzing anything else. Now, I want to be clear here, I'm not actually bashing this article or this study itself. They can study, frankly, whatever they want and however they want to do it. And they should. Sometimes asking seemingly stupid questions, or looking at things in an unusual way, or testing what you already believe to be a known outcome is what accidentally generates the best insights. That's just the nature of science, and I have no problem with that. What I'm actually bashing is the Liberals' reliance on this article as essentially the chief evidence and justification for why they need to implement the handgun freeze despite its overwhelming evidentiary deficiencies. And the Oaks test tells us that the infringing laws must be enacted on causality and rational considerations. And this article does not show causality, not even remotely, nor does it even attempt to, and it openly admits this. And not only that, but as some of you may have already noticed, this article is quite old. It actually dates all the way back to 2003, but it gets worse. Many of the articles this one cites are significantly older than even that. Many of them were from the 90s, but some of them go back even further than that, which means the information that those articles are based on are probably even older still. Much of the basis of the information for this article would likely predate even the 90s. So this source of information should be questionable on those grounds alone, but this information also predates something else that was very important in Canada to firearms, which happened in the 90s. The Firearms Act. The Firearms Act was signed into law in 1995. This means that the bulk of the information studied in this article would probably predate the Firearms Act. So not only does this article fail to show causality, it's based on information that's so old it's not even relevant anymore. By relying on this study for the core justification of their freeze, the Liberals essentially said that the reason they need to freeze handguns in Canada in 2022 was because before the Firearms Act was introduced, Canada's gun laws in the 20th century were ineffective at preventing America's gun problem. <laughs> Which is obviously ridiculous. To call that merely an irrational consideration would be rather magnanimous of us to say the least. It's certainly far more decorum than the Liberals should be afforded considering what they're doing to us. However, there is still one last issue to address with the Oaks test. In the absence of any good, concrete information, they are permitted to use almost any logic or reason that they want. So we do need to not just say that they're wrong, but we actually have to prove that they're wrong using these same rules.
And this is actually something that I quite dislike about Section 1, since it basically permits the government to make whatever outlandish claims they want, and then puts the duty on us to disprove it. And in essence, this requirement invalidates the purpose of the Yolks test to begin with. Like, if there is insufficient evidence to prove their position or their assertions true, then reason or logic should not actually suffice, in my opinion. Like, it kind of feels like that defeats the purpose of them having the onus to prove causality in the first place. Like, if they lack sufficient evidence to override our rights and freedoms, that shouldn't somehow default to becoming evidence to override our rights and freedoms. But, again, that seems to be the way that things work in Canada, according to the courts, so we're going to be going with that. So, back to their crappy article, this kind of begs the question, why are they using such outdated and international information? Because, after all, there is readily available concrete, easy to access, contemporary, and intelligible information available here in Canada. This information is procured and provided by the Government of Canada itself. It's called Statistics Canada. Why isn't StatsCan, or more specifically their Juristat articles, why aren't these being cited instead? Like, surely that would have to be the more accurate and the more relevant information to be using. It's kind of even suspicious in and of itself when you think about it. Like, they went well out of their way to find an almost ancient study which agreed with their presupposition while avoiding using the more concrete, readily available, up-to-date information. Well, the reason is probably because the more reliable evidence overtly and overwhelmingly disproves their claims. Now, to be sure that we aren't misquoting their position, let's make absolutely clear what their position actually is. Their position, very specifically, is that more guns causes more issues. More guns, more issues, more guns, more issues. And this rhetoric also appears in the 2020 assault style order and councils. According to them, the issue is directly tied to the number of guns in circulation. Our goal over time is to see the amount of handguns in our communities reduced. There is a very strong correlation in the explosion of the handgun universe and the increase in handgun crime. Gun violence is a complex problem, but at the end of the day, the math is really quite simple. The fewer the guns in our communities, the safer everyone will be. So if the assertion is correct, we should be able to look at the core data and see some obvious correlation or association between the number of handguns and the number of handgun crimes. Like, this is a bizarrely easy claim to analyze. It requires no supposition or conjecture. All you have to do is put the number of handguns in Canada on a graph over time, and put the number of handgun crimes on a graph over time. Both are known quantities. This is the result. You see an 89% increase in the number of handguns in the 12 years between 2009 and 2021, and merely a 1.9% increase in handgun crime during the same time frame. If you want to know more about where these numbers come from, I did a video on that as well, link down in the description. But the number of handgun comes directly from the Handgun Freeze OIC, and the number of handgun crimes come directly from the Juristat article from 2024. Which means that ultimately these numbers are really not up for any kind of debate, as these numbers were gathered and provided by the government itself. And this is absolute bulletproof evidence that their assertion is not only unfounded, but that it's actually outright wrong. Unless the government wants to then argue that their own data gathering agency is somehow wrong. Now it's worth noting that this graph does not analyze any other information, it is merely the number of lawfully owned handguns, and the number of violent handgun crimes. That's it. It follows the exact same faulty methodology that their chosen article did, but it uses the relevant data set from the most recent 12 years in Canada instead of data sets from around the world, which originate in a different millennia. Now, you might be saying here, hey, you know, they did both go up. Handgun crime went up. Not by a lot, but, but it did go up. And, well, actually, not really. Because all crime goes up when the population goes up. It's why you always see crime measured as a crime rate, usually per 100,000. If we plot our graph again, against the population sizes of the same period, handgun rates go up and handgun crime rates actually go down. The graph trends in opposite directions. So not only is there no causation to be found in their assertion, the liberals don't even have a correlation to fall back on. It's literally just a bare assertion. It's an empty claim that is easily disprovable with readily available information provided by the government itself. And this is obviously why the government avoided using Juristat as evidence for their freeze. 
So what is the actual cause of handgun crime, or even firearm crime in general? Well, Juristat actually tells us this as well, and, and not suggestively either. In both of their 2022 and 2024 articles on firearm-related violent crime, they imply that firearm crime is caused by violent crime. In 2022, they said, quote, These high rates of firearm-related violent crime may be a reflection of overall high rates of violence, end quote. And then in 2024, they also said, quote, Generally speaking, the trend for all violent crime, whether or not a firearm was involved, was rather similar to the trend observed for firearm-related violent crime, end quote. And then, in their 2024 article, they stopped beating around the bush and they finally said this. Quote, The rate of firearm-related violent crime increased because violent crime in general was on the rise. End quote. So, according to Juristat and the CCJCSS who runs it, gun violence is caused by violence, not by guns. It is a symptom of violent crime itself. And if you think that's somehow incorrect, or I'm quoting them out of context, the statistical information also backs up this claim rather easily. If we take a look at this graph from the 2022 Juristat article, the nearly perfect linear relation between gun crime and overall violent crime is pretty self-evident. The two lines follow each other almost perfectly. Now, there is an anomaly in 2014 and 2015 where the proportionality changed slightly for some unknown reason, that's a reason unknown both to myself and to Juristat as far as I can tell. But before and after this time period, there is almost a perfect correlation on the graph between gun crime and violent crime. Now, while correlation itself is not causation, when observing this level of correlation in a social science analysis, it's usually quite indicative of causation, or at least it's about as accurate as you can hope to be. Now, the Oaks test precedent does say that where there is conflicting social science evidence, reason and logic may suffice. And this could certainly qualify as conflicting evidence. Juristat and the Liberals' articles present extremely contradictory understandings of the causes of gun violence. But it is worth noting something here. Not all evidence is equal. For example, there is plenty of evidence out there that says that the Earth is in fact round. You can also find plenty of evidence out there that says that the Earth is flat. There is no shortage of self-proclaimed experts and scientists who would support the flat earth claims. But even knowing that, it would not be correct to say that there is conflicting evidence as to whether or not the earth is round just because the flat earthers are really adamant about their viewpoint. One view is based on well-established truth and backed up by experimentation, and it can easily withstand scrutiny. While the other view is based on rhetoric, unfounded concepts, and deliberately avoids any scrutiny. And likewise, just because the Liberals are very insistent on the position that more guns cause more harm, that doesn't make it true. And it's also worth noting that the Liberals' article itself admits that it's only typically true that more guns means more gun violence. Which again means that there are times where this is not true. And therefore, at least in part, this article actually agrees with Juristat. Their article openly admits that there are times and places where more guns do not mean more harm. Modern Canada appears to be one of those times and places. This means that the Liberals would have to prove why the well-established truth by Juristat is wrong in order to pass the Oaks test. And even if evidence from other countries would say it's true, that doesn't mean it's true in Canada with our culture and our laws. Evidence from other countries which doesn't align with our evidence here in Canada should simply not be admissible in evidence. Like, historically, the stated purpose of firearms regulation in Canada has been to limit the harm posed by firearms while allowing Canadians to use them safely, right? Like, if our gun laws work as advertised, it's completely logical that we should see a pretty significant difference between our country and other countries when it comes to firearm-related violence and crime stats. That's, that's kind of the whole point, isn't it? The statistics provided by Juristat would indicate that further handgun restrictions would be ineffective at reducing gun crime in Canada in any meaningful way because, as I've already showed you, the increase of handgun ownership is already not negatively affecting the handgun violence rate. The government should not then be able to go and say that our gun laws don't go far enough because other countries still experience high levels of gun violence. Like, it's not reasonable to claim that if these other countries have a gun problem, it's somehow because of our lax gun laws in Canada. That's utterly nonsensical. And if you limit the evidence to only that which is based in Canada, there is no statistical indication that limiting or reducing handgun will affect handgun violence.
and it's for these reasons that the handgun freeze fails on the rational connection portion of the Oaks test. So, what does all this mean? Is the handgun freeze unconstitutional? Well, I mean, based on what I've showed you in this video, I would say yes. The handgun freeze is unconstitutional. We have clearly showed that the freeze violates Section 7 of the Charter based on Supreme Court precedent, and that it cannot be demonstrably justified under Section 1 as it clearly fails the rational connection portion of the Oaks test. But, as I've said many times on this channel, I'm no lawyer. Constitutional law is, is very complicated, and there is certainly always the possibility that I'm wrong. Additionally, if this were actually before a court, we would have to contend with a lot more liberal evidence and experts than just the one article mentioned here today, but they would be disprovable as well. What I've shown you here today is just a simplified explanation of what would surely be a very complicated process. This is just a start, but it's a good start. It's a foundation to build on, and I will be expanding on this topic in future videos. We would need far more than just one good argument in order to sway the likely negative predisposition of a judge to find our position favorable. And this is because in all government decisions and legislation, the government is typically to be afforded deference. Now, deference is basically that when legislation comes under scrutiny by the courts, the court is essentially supposed to give the government like, the benefit of the doubt if there is one to be had. Deference is apparently also to be considered in Section 1 challenges, which, again, kind of feels like it breaks the whole purpose of the Oaks Test to begin with, in my opinion. It's well established that the burden of proof under Section 1 and the Oaks Test lies with the government. However, it also appears to be true that if there's any room to debate the evidence, the court has a mandate to side with the government. Under this interpretation, the government doesn't need to prove that they're right, they just need to create enough doubt that there's the possibility that they might not be wrong. Now, to be fair, I can certainly understand where this rationale might have value at differing levels of the legislative process, but it should have no place in a Section 1 Charter challenge. So it appears that, over time, the onerous requirement for the government to be demonstrably justified has been perverted into the people need to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the government is wrong. And that's not at all what Section 1 or the Oak Test says. But, as far as I can tell, that does appear to be how things work in Canada. The Charterpedia does go on to say that deference is inappropriate in certain areas, such as Section 7 and 8 charter violation. These are the sections that the handgun freeze likely engages most, in my opinion, and as such the government should be afforded minimal deference in this instance. But that's not the same thing as saying that they should not be given it at all. However, there is one last thing to note here. There is more evidence about C-21 itself which suggests that I'm right that C-21, or at least the handgun freeze, is a charter violation. If you remember that list of all the various reasons of which the government can use under Section 1 to violate your rights, these reasons show up very directly and very specifically in the handgun freeze OIC and related press releases. Gun violence is a complex problem. One of every three girls and women killed by an abuser is murdered with a gun. The use of this language would indicate that the government knew from the start that the freeze, or even C-21 in general, was a charter violation. It's likely that the reason that their press conferences and releases have been laced with these terms is that they've been prepping C-21 for a Section 1 charter battle since its inception. Meaning that, even if I am wrong about how Section 7's Liberty Clause works, it's quite likely that there are any number of other ways to prove that this is unconstitutional, and the Liberal government is banking on their Section 1 protections in order to keep the handgun freeze in play. It is also worth mentioning that the case I've laid out here today is related only to the handgun freeze itself. Most of what I said would not apply to the rest of the statutes in C-21. There's nowhere near enough information presented in this video to have the whole legislation just struck down. So, for example, this video would have no effect on their red or yellow flag laws, on their computer data offenses, or any number of C-21 statutes. Not that those statutes couldn't be unconstitutional, but they'd have to be unconstitutional for different reasons. However, there is some overlap in other areas of the bill, such as their new evergreen definition for what constitutes an assault-style firearm. According to C-21 and the Liberals, what makes a gun too dangerous to own is not its fire rate, or its ammo capacity, or its caliber, or firepower, or anything like that. This new definition says that some guns are too dangerous based on the date of their design and manufacture. And that is a market regulation, and not a public safety regulation. It's also not a ban. It also doesn't limit any kind of capability, since said capabilities are still legal to own, use, and even purchase, provided that they are on a gun which was designed and manufactured before December 15th, 2023. Additionally, this video would also have no impact on the so-called assault-style rifle bans of 2020. 
However, the way to overturn that ban is much more simple. We don't have to use the constitution, although we certainly can. And instead, all we have to do is prove that it was against the law, or rather, prove that it was ultra viris. Ultra viris meaning that it was outside the scope of the law and above the authority that the law gave them to act. That, that is a much easier thing to do than a constitutional challenge like this video did. And I don't want to get anyone's hopes up here, but that argument is a slam dunk. When the CCFR gets the repeal, provided the judge isn't corrupt or incomprehensibly biased like Justice Kane was, the court will rule in our favor and will overturn that OIC. Now, you never know how a judge will actually rule or what internal preconceptions they may have, which will affect their decision. But the law is very clearly on our side for that one. It is extremely evident that the 2020 OIC was a violation of the powers given to them under section 117.15. And more importantly, I can prove it. But that's a video for another day. That video will be significantly shorter and much more straightforward than this one was. So get subscribed and stay tuned if you want to see that. And for those of you who are still here, I'd like to thank you all for watching. What do you guys think? Do you think the handgun freeze is actually unconstitutional? And do you want to see more long-form, in-depth legal analysis content like this? Or would you prefer shorter, more streamlined content without all this legal precedent and background going on? Additionally, if you guys have any other good suggestions or arguments for the gun control conversation, be sure to put them in the comments down below, and you may even be featured in a future video as well. All that being said, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.